Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Evan, welcome back. Uh, because you're back, I, I have my first question is for you. What is today's date? Is it someone's birthday? <laughs> I don't know. Check your calendar and subtract <laughs> three days. <laughs> Uh, it is December 1st. That's right. December 1st. I'm not even going to ask when the wreath on the front of your door was, was put up oh, because I know it's n- wasn't today. The wreath on the front of my door was up 21 days ago. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's December 1st. You're right. You're on the right path with the wreath. It is, you know, the festive season. It's the holidays. Uh, I, it, I think it's fair game for both of you now. I, I know I'm a little bit more holiday happy, a little bit nutty, uh, Compared to YouTube, but December first is fair game. Agree. My Christmas tree went up yesterday. Okay, good. Okay, Ours so this is going up on Saturday, and that's primarily because we're going to be away next weekend, and then the weekend after. And then Catherine's like, "Well, at that point, if we don't have the Christmas tree up, and it's two days until Christmas, we're not putting it up at all." So you got to do it. It's Saturday or nothing. Because it's the festive season, I actually have a gift for both of you. It's not for me. This is actually from. You're going to get a kick out of this. And if you're listening on audio, I'll, I'll describe what it is in a second. This is from our friendly neighborhood social Red Wing social media admins. I'll give Brad his first, and you'll you'll understand why in a second. Okay. Brad? <laughs> <laughs> Does Brad hate that jersey? <laughs> not as much as I, now that I've seen the full uniform, but still it's not great. Okay. Brad, <laughs> Brad is holding a Lucas Raymond... Detroit Red Wings reverse retro jersey official. Thank you to our friends from the Detroit Red Wings. Did uh, they get Brad the the children's size that he usually wears? Yeah, we got him a children's uh, large. So smart. So I will say this actually is an adult large. So to the Red Wings, at, uh, both social men, can... thank you so much for the compliment. <laughs> uh, Evan, you have your choice between uh, Dylan Larkin and uh, Mo Sider. I'll take the Mo Sider. Perfect. I wanted the Larkin. Okay. I was thinking because, you know, you're a former defenseman. Maybe you uh, <laughs> would relate to it. I that, that was my thinking, and I love Mo, but I love the C on these, the diamond C. So Legitimately, that's my favorite part of the jersey. I yeah. love the diamond yeah. C and A's on those. So to our friends from the Red Wings, thank you so much. Yeah, these are awesome. Uh, I'm going to take a second and put these on. Again, thank you to uh, our friends at the Red Wings uh, wearing these now. So for those of you who are listening, we are now all three of us wearing the reverse retro jerseys, no <laughs> yeah. matter what our opinions were on it. <laughs> I think it was uh, lukewarm. I really liked him. Brad had his feelings on him. But hey, it looks good I, on you, buddy. I've I've softened my opinion on yeah, them. Because they do. They, they did look better. With the red gear, it yeah. did make a huge difference. So like when I saw just the jersey in isolation, my opinion was like, a two out of ten yeah. on them. Seeing the full get up, I've gotten up to probably about a five or a six out of ten. Would have preferred it if it wasn't black and it was white stripes instead. You know. But now you're rocking it, so it gets an extra point hey, five. The worst Red Wings jersey is still better than all thirty one other jerseys. Beautiful. So the Red Wings are actually wearing these jerseys. So their first game was uh, November twenty eighth against Toronto, of course, and they're also scheduled to be to be worn on December thirteenth. Uh, against Carolina, December 31st against Ottawa, January 10th uh, against Winnipeg, January 24th against San Jose, and February 11th first Vancouver. So if you're interested in one, I mean, you go to the team store at the LCA or uh, I'm sure grab them online as well. So, uh, yeah, they have uh, a few games coming up. December 13th against Carolina is the next one. Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel podcast. Full roster today, all wearing the reverse retro jersey. <laughs> uh, here to talk to you about Red Wings hockey uh, and the world of the NHL. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. Uh, on this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast, we'll recap the Red Wings' interesting last couple of games uh, against Toronto and Buffalo. Uh, some storylines, good and bad, coming out of that. Bertuzzi's hurt again. Uh, some... Uh, players with notable performances in, in either direction. Uh, Magnus Helberg, we have some more clarity on what's happening with him. Uh, Alex Nedeljkovic, it's going to be a conversation now, I think maybe a little bit uncomfortably for some Red Wings fans uh, in the team. And then there's some uh, pretty big stories across the NHL from you know everywhere from Chris, Chris Letang to Jason Robertson and, and everything in between. So we'll see how this one goes. 
Uh, before that, I'll, I'll let you know that this will likely be a shorter episode. Uh, I am just through the door, not too long before these guys got here. Uh, I actually had the uh, privilege of going to Hot Stove Stories with Mickey and Ken, uh, hosted the event, and I got to tell you, that was way easier than even doing this pod because if with Dan O'Halloran, Wes McCauley, Chris Draper, Chris Osgood, and Ken and Mick there. You just put a quarter in them? Uh, yep. <laughs> nudge them in the right direction, and it was just... I said at the event there was uh, there were more stories left on the page than we were able to get through there. It was it was really fantastic. Uh, I just want to give a big shout out to everyone who showed up and all of you who participated in the silent auction as well. Uh, you helped raise some really 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 good money for the Jamie Daniels Foundation. I, I'll I won't spoil it. I'll let them announce it first. But uh, you made a huge impact this morning, and uh, you were a phenomenal crowd. And yeah, the stories we heard were hilarious. At one point, I I tried uh, I was prompting. The Chris is Draper and Osgood about the Scotty Bowman thinking one of them was at the bar when they weren't, and and the other one got basically got them in trouble. And I I got it mixed up backwards, and I was saying, "Oh, Ozzy, do you remember when you know Draper was at the bar and you were back at the hotel, and uh, Scotty was sure that you were there?" And Chris goes, "No, it was me. I was at the hotel." He's like, "You're just like Scotty." <laughs> <laughs> it was great, and you know what? Having the referees there was awesome too. To hear from Dan and and his experience and. And Wes, who who referees the game right now, is uh, it was a really fantastic event, and um, yeah, I had no work to do. So yeah, your words per sixty was about on par with Philip Zadina's shooting percentage. That is the most apt way. Except I don't have to feel bad about that. <laughs> so uh, to learn more about the Jamie Daniels Foundation, visit jamiedanielsfoundation.org if you want to join in uh, their fight against sub- substance use disorder. Uh, there's a lot more coming up uh, in terms of our support for them, but just want to give a shout out for that. And I think before we move forward, we are now safe to announce on a main episode, the next Winged Wheel podcast night at the LCA, Saturday, April 8th, 2023. It is the game against the Pittsburgh Penguins, and it is our second iteration of the event. Our partnered with the Detroit Red Wings this year. DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP to get your tickets. Link is also in the description. It's a discounted ticket with a special Winged Wheel podcast discount. A portion of the proceeds goes to the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Uh, You get access to the pregame live recording of the Winged Wheel podcast. Plus, we have some extra little bonuses for you this time. So more details to come. I'll get into it more in future episodes. But uh, DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. Here's your first crack at getting those tickets. All right. The Red Wings got into the tough part of their schedule, the first part of the tough part of their schedule, I'd say, wearing these jerseys against Toronto, first time. And uh, that was, I'll let you kick it off, Brad, but in my mind, that was the inverse Red Wings game based on how they've played the rest of the season. And I know we disagree on that, so I'll I'll let you go first to, to recap that game for Detroit. This game was probably the best way to describe what the Detroit Red Wings are this season. It was the perfect encapsulation of what this team has become. And I do mean that in a mostly positive way. Toronto, despite all the memes and the history, is one of the best teams in the league right now. And they are on, they have been on a prolonged heater going into this game. So it should be no surprise that they beat the Red Wings. But the way that game played out is, like I said, a perfect encapsulation of what this team is. If you look at who controlled the play, how the game went, and what the final result was, it was a fairly even game with, I'd say, Detroit having a slight edge in controlling the play. But Toronto was easily able to outgun them. The Red Wings did not have the big guns to keep up with the Leafs' offense. And the Leafs, when given chances, have the talent and the skill through a bigger part of their lineup to create offense. I mean, Austin Matthews walks open in the slot. That's a goal 100 out of 100 times. Do the Red Wings have a single player who's going to convert on that shot 50% of the time? The Red Wings like I said, probably had more control of the game, but they probably had less high danger chances. They generated more quantity, but less quality than the Leafs. And I think that was a simple talent discrepancy because, again, you could see 
the Lalonde effect in this game. The Red Wings did a fairly good job of limiting what the Leafs could bring to the table. They did a good job controlling play. Special teams were okay, whatever that game. And when you look at the overall picture, you have Matthews, Nylander, and Marner on the board. Didn't happen for the Wings because the, the Wings don't have a Matthews or a Marner. So I'm not going to say that was a bad game for the Wings. I think this is when you have a team like the Leafs firing on all cylinders, a 4-2 loss is about what I would expect. And the Red Wings played fine. The Red, I'd say the Red Wings played good. But until they get more talent in the lineup, However that may be, this is what we can expect. Yeah, see, I don't even disagree with you there. Uh, I, I think you're exactly right. I think the talent discrepancy is ultimately what made the difference. But what was, what was funny to me was I genuinely do believe this is the inverse of when the Red Wings would beat a better team or a team at their level. First of all, they started their game off hot with uh, Kubelik and Larkin crashing the net with their with their rush and Sider coming in and burying a puck. Toronto not clearing their crease, and I could hear Evan laughing from his house at that. Uh, so Sider gets the goal within the first five minutes to start. I'm like, oh, great, the Red Wings got a hot start. And then the Red Wings goaltending let them down. That was Vili Huso, very obviously, I think, probably tired, the amount of starts that he's had over the last little while. like he He's played quite a few games. It had been some time since Ned had seen the crease before that. So, you know, Vili Huso had Nashville and Arizona before it. Can you even blame him on the first period goals, though? That's it. Okay. Nobody's stopping Austin Matthews from that spot on the ice. And then the Nylander rebound. Yeah, you probably want to see a bit better rebound control, but that tip I, from Tavares was. Yeah, the tip. And then Nylander puts it right under the bar. Like, what's a. What's a goalie doing on a rebound there? Not nothing. He couldn't do anything. I think a good goal. I think a goalie on his game probably wouldn't have let four in, those four. Yeah, the Marner goal, I did not like at all. No, Marner goal. And really the Rasmus Sandin goal. Watch the Rasmus Sandin goal. Uh, screened himself. Glove went in front of his head while he was... Uh, never was... go crossbody. You no. never, even, I'm not even a goalie. I know you never go crossbody. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was an off night for Huso. It is what it is. So the Red Wings control play, more or less. They, they start hot. Their goalie lets them down. Uh, the other team's goalie is making pretty much every save that they need to make. And uh, special teams fails Detroit. And then they lost. <laughs> that has not happened this year. Like, that is the opposite. That said, uh, I think... A, a, uh, well, again, how many times have we said, are the Red Wings going to regress to the mean when the schedule gets tougher? I, this is exactly what we meant. That's a litmus this, test game. That's, yeah, that's, this is yeah. exactly what we meant. Is Huso going to be that good all year? No, of course not. Not Very, very few goalies are, and those that are are winning Veznas regularly. That's what separates the Vasilevskis from the Husos, right? Um, other teams are Arizona and, you know, Montreal going to finish on the chances like Toronto did? No, of course not. So the Red Wings can get away with more mistakes. This is what we were expecting when we said when the schedule gets tougher, the Red Wings flaws are going to be exposed. And it's exactly what happened. But the huge positive here is in years past, that's an 8-2 game. Oh, my God. that That's a game that gets away from them. Toronto's clicking. That's a game Detroit, where Evans messaging the group chat a period and a half in going, holy shit. The Leafs, <laughs> yeah, the Leafs control 80% of that game. Yeah. That that did not happen this game. So again, the Red Wings flaws were exposed for what they were, and that's fine. I'm not even saying that as a bad thing. We knew what they were. We just they were just able to mask them with a weaker schedule. But now their flaws were exposed, and they were still right in that game with the Leafs. Yeah. That is a good sign. I think it was Linda online replied to me and she was like, this is kind of the lot, not that you want to see a loss, but this is the kind of loss you want to see. And, and yeah, that's the answer. Yeah. I think for the Red Wings to be a playoff team, moral victories don't mean shit. Like, no, you don't the, get points for moral victories. You get no. points for losing, but yeah. not for moral victories. In this. I don't know if I legit, and I'm not even saying this as like um, anything facetious. I don't know if the Red Wings are at or past the point of moral victories because I, I truly still don't know what the expectation should be for this season. Painful though it may be. Even though I don't want this to be the truth, moral victories probably still matter for them. And and that game was a good moral victory, despite walking away with zero points for a team that's expecting, not expecting, but trying to make the playoffs. So, yeah. again, I don't know how to feel about it. You got to get points. We'll talk about that with the Buffalo game. Yeah. But if you if you are still a believer in moral victories, you can hang your hat on that game. 
One last thing I want to talk about, and and you called this out, Brad. Like, there was no finishing with Detroit. It, it was a talent issue, more or less. Larkin after the game said, like they if if they replay that game a bunch more times, they would have finished at least a little bit more. And where I disagree a little bit is is that I don't think Detroit made Matt Murray stand on his head. Like they controlled play, and they had points where there definitely were quality offensive chances. But when they needed them, like on the power play or in key moments, I just felt that too often Toronto was able to mitigate the amount of danger in Detroit's offensive opportunities. Again, not the entire time, um, but Detroit kind of came and went. I will say, though, at the end, uh, it's hilarious that the two goals were, you know, Mo Sider crashing the net and the other one, Mo Sider walking the blue line. Uh, the Dirk Nowitzki fadeaway. Oh, I've not seen a defenseman <laughs> that big shoot a fadeaway shot in my life. That was hilarious. I It was like the footwork and the ability to pivot and step back and shoot like that. If I tried that in hockey, I'd fall, break my tailbone, and the puck wouldn't make it even to the top of the circles. Comparing myself to most siders is a, a fool's task, but like that was incredibly impressive. Probably the lowest danger shot <laughs> statistically. But hey, something had to go in for Detroit. And it's good that that did. And good for Adam Ernie for getting that redirect. Um, pretty forgettable game defensively for for Sider and Sherratt, which has been a little bit of a trend. But we've talked about that one ad nauseum. Yeah. And I'm sure we're going to talk about it plenty more coming up. Let's jump to the Buffalo game. What the hell happened? I'm going to give you one stat on the Buffalo game. And then we can start. Is it goaltending related? No, no, no. Because that's <laughs> that's going to be the topic. Face-off percentage in that game, 68 to 32. 68% to 32% in favor of the Detroit Red Wings. In this year of our Lord, the 2022-2023 season, the Red Wings won 68% of their face-offs. At one point... They won the game, right? Because that's what that means? <clears throat> Anyways, folks, thanks for tuning into this episode of the New <laughs> Podcast. Yeah, that game. Hey, the Red Wings started hot, started off hot again. Jonathan Bergeron, uh finishing on the outside, nice finish, kind of through a screen or through sticks, more or less. Hironic on the assist, Valeno on the assist. If you want the perfect example of what's changed with Hironic this season, that was that was the play. That was the shining example because for the last three years, you know that play, the way it broke down, is going directly into that defender's shin. Oh yeah. And instead, he holds it, waits, waits, and just five foot touch past it, Bergren, Bergren, for an A plus chance. That is the fundamental difference in Philip Hronick's game this season. And that's how the game started. And we were like, oh, hell yeah. That is the exact start Detroit needed. They're coming in to play Buffalo uh, at home after that Toronto game. Like, that's exactly how you need to start that game against a team where you should be walking away with at least a point. Nedeljkovic uh, was starting this game. He he came in for Huso in relief the game before. And my uh, that was like uh, at a loss for words at those goals that were going in on Ned. Like that was as bad as the LA performance in my mind. That was the game. You can get away with one or two bad ones every now and then against the Leafs, and it be perfectly justified. (laughs) We've talked a few times about you can't let points slip away against bad teams. And Buffalo is a bad team, make no mistake. They, since that shit-kicking of the Red Wings a month or two ago, however long ago it was, the Sabres went straight into the toilet. They have been awful. That only gets heightened when the teams around them in the schedule are so good that you look at that game and you go, we, this is where we need to get two points. And then that gets amplified even more when you can isolate the reason you lost that point. Ned doesn't have an easy task this year. He's coming in playing behind Huso, who has been lights out. He's, you know, he didn't get the exact framework of games to set himself up to get into a groove, to get into a rhythm at the start of the year on back to backs, tough games, road games, whatever it might be. But at some point, you got to make the save. And now I also want to call out the, the Red Wings went into the third period losing 4 1. And that wasn't only because of Ned. Ned let in four goals 
I, I think two or three, no question should have been stopped. And it's so same story as the game with, with Huso in my mind, although uglier in, in my mind, um, in my opinion, in terms of the goals that went in. But the Red Wings also were out of whack in front of them. Yeah, they started off hot with the uh, with the Bergman goal to start the game, but then, you know, the end of the game, 0 for 7 on the power play. That's, what, the second time we have an 0 for 7 stat line on the power play this season, something like that? A 5 on 3 at the end of the game to potentially take the lead? Like, does one beget the other? Yeah, probably. I'm sure the team was pretty deflated after those goals went in, but at the same time, like, the team did show up for net in the end, and I think the as ridiculous as it sounds to say, I was talking to someone at the game. I said, I know this sounds insane, but after the fourth goal, Ned actually made some pretty key saves and he buckled down. It's just a shame that it got to four goals, both for him and the team in terms of how they were playing and what he was letting in. That game shouldn't have been such a grind to get a point, period. It's great that they walked away with a point, and we'll get into the fun part in a second, but it should not have been such a grind to get that point. Yes, when you actually break down what separates elite goalies from good goalies from average goalies to bad goalies in the NHL it has no almost I'm not gonna say nothing but it has very little to do with talent we've seen the Boston game being the example this year how one off night can absolutely sewer a guy's stats because Billy Huso was pitching like a 940-something outside of that one game. Yeah, the Rangers. And game. that dropped him to like a 919 at, at whatever point we were looking that up a week ago. You know why Vasilevsky, Hellebuck, all the, pick whatever top goal you want, doesn't have that problem? They don't have off nights. And their off nights aren't like that. Their off nights are, ah, uh, they probably could have had should have had that one. They let in three instead of two. The consistency, the mentality to be always on, or worst case, 95%, they are dialed in. So you can see the gap from a Vasilevsky to a Huso, where Huso this year, I'd say all but two, maybe three games, has been very good. Very good to great. Yeah. But those two, three games bring him down to still above, but... Closer to league average. Ned has one or two of these every game this season. And sometimes like the Buffalo game more. He has all the talent that an NHL goalie should have. It's it's simply consistency. We've seen Ned have great stretches of games. We've seen him make incredible saves. We've seen Ned in Detroit look like the Ned in Carolina. It's been there. It's happened. But the consistency has never been there. And that is what you need to have as an NHL goalie. More to come on that after um, uh, the break in a, a little bit here. But for the rest of the Buffalo game, the Red Wings did actually show up. Like Ned made a couple key saves, and it's like, okay, they just have to crack Anderson. They just have to break through. And if Ned can keep the, the, the net tight, then maybe they can do something. Halfway through the third, or you know, less than halfway through in the through the third, David Perron squeaks one through. That probably shouldn't have gotten through Anderson. And it's like, okay, there's a there's a there's crack life. in the wall. Yeah, there's a little bit. And then who other than Oscar Sunkfist? Chaotic Mo Cider. Three third period goals between Perron and Sunkfist. Thank you, St. Louis. Yeah, honestly. And it was Darren Pang calling the game for TNT, so <laughs> uh or he was between the benches at least. So Sunkfist uh, scores at 10.41 in the third, and Sunkfist scores again at 12.31 in the third. So the Red Wings tying that game 4-4 was like the, cl- the crowd was electric. After the Sunkfist tying goal, I thought my eardrums were going to blow out. It was That was the LCA that you love to see this season. Uh, Cop assisting on both of them, which was, we're going to talk about that in a second too. Rona got on the, uh, on the score sheet. Uh, Larkin got on the sh- score sheet. All that. And the Red Wings still should have won that game in regulation, I think, because they had that five on three late in the game. It was like a minute 27 of five on three. It actually should have been like a minute 37 of five on three, but they didn't pick up that there was another delayed penalty and uh, they didn't give it to Buffalo soon enough. But yeah, the Red Wings 
should have closed it out in regulation. I'm not going to complain that they came de- back from three goals down and didn't make it four consecutive goals, but in my mind, you've got to convert uh, on that two-man advantage late in the game. That's what killed them. 0 for 7 on the power play, a late game with all the momentum in your favor, uh, five on three, and, and you're not going to convert. Yeah, Ned shouldn't have let those goals in, but at the same time, the Red Wings didn't do much to help themselves when they could have broken through and made the difference. Well, that five on three circles back to that conversation we had about the Leaf game. You know who doesn't bungle those opportunities? Toronto, Colorado, Tampa, Boston, because they have just Toronto does when it matters, but yeah, yeah, this is the playoffs. The, this yeah. is not the first round of the playoffs, Ryan. So my point stands. It's not April, May, yeah, yeah, exactly, but. It's just the way it happens. And, you know, not that the Red Wings are devoid of talent. I'm not saying Larkin, Raymond, you know, maybe a couple other guys aren't at the level of some of the guys on these other teams. But the Red Wings have so few of them that they have to lean on them that much more. And when they don't, if they have an off night, if they have an off shift, there's way too many times you just you can see nothing's going to come of it or in a very, very key moment, nothing comes of it. Went to overtime. Overtime was almost completely controlled by Buffalo. Killed the entire time. I think the final shots were like 1-1 one, one or something stupid like that. I'm like, really? You're going to control the puck for that five, almost five full minutes and get one shot on net? That was the best case. If you ever want an argument for an over and back rule to, to blow the play dead in overtime, use Buffalo's control of play there. Uh, went to a shootout. Goalies were uh, perfect. Well, Detroit actually hit two posts between Larkin. Uh, what was it? Yeah, Larkin and Perron, I think, both hit the post. And uh, Jack Quinn, uh, that was a filthy shootout winner. Nasty. He like ne- he made Ned bite two different times on that. Like Jack Quinn is sick, though. He's This is why Jack Quinn's in the NHL. Yeah. He, he is what you would call a specialist. Yep. So the Red Wings walk away with uh, one point out of those uh, potential four uh, from last game till now. Again, not the end of the world. It is what it is. Uh, unfortunately, some other storylines from that game... Tyler Bertuzzi blocks a shot to his hand, breaks something in his hand wrist again, and get this, other hand. We're all about balance here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Listen, hockey gods, I understand Red Wings fans have been spoiled over the last 25, 30 years. I get that. But what, what specifically? Like, this <laughs> is big, like, screw these guys specifically energy right now. And I understand, like, there's a lot that goes into you got to be smart about where you take the shots. And, and sometimes it's incidental and sometimes you can control it. But of all the players where you're like, the Red Wings need this guy playing and they need him playing well for every possible reason, Tyler Bertuzzi is arguably the most important player of that nature on the Red Wings. We know what Dylan Larkin's likely future is with this team. It's just at what number and how long they, they want to stretch this out. On the there, There's an off chance that it doesn't work out, you know, long term with Detroit, but the likely solution here is a contract. Tyler Bertuzzi, I think the more likely solution here, as we can see so far, is a trade. You can't trade a guy who's not playing. You can't trade a guy who's not playing well. Or and if you want to sign him, it's hard to sign a guy who's not healthy. It's hard to sign a guy when you don't know how he's playing in a damn contract year. Terrible news for Bertuzzi. Terrible news for the Red Wings. He's back on IR. Zarnik is called back up to, the, to, to Hockey Town. But, oh, my God, man. Like, he came off the bench pissed. Broke a stick almost off the boards, I think it was, which I was like, well, don't swing that hard if you have a broken hand <laughs> right down the tunnel. But that's uh, that's a big knock for Detroit. Well, what do we do with Bertuzzi with this other injury now? Because this is kind of the catch-22. You can't sign a guy who's always hurt. You can't trade a guy who's always hurt. He's creating more uncertainty in the contract discussion because what clarity do we have on what Tyler Bertuzzi is? We He was kind of like muddied water in the offseason because of his previous injuries and him getting uh, being more of a late bloomer. Okay, so we knew it would be a complicated contract negotiation, even under the best of circumstances, if right. he played all season. Now he's going to barely play. At the trade deadline, and if you're a team, just use the Leafs, for example, right now, who could use a player like Tyler Bertuzzi, well, what are you giving up for a guy who's barely played this year? 
I think they're going to looking at other players, to be honest. I don't even think they're all that interested in Tyler Bertuzzi at and, this point. And let's call a spade a spade. While Bertuzzi has been playing this year, he hasn't been Tyler Bertuzzi. No, he's he's not had his legs. He's he's missed the start of the year. Very obviously, it's hard. It's been hard for him to catch up. The same way where Cop, I mean, Cop is seemed to be catching up now, but Cop struggled to catch up to start. And also, there's something to be said. The way Bertuzzi has to fit into. Uh, Lalone system of team defense and minimizing risk. Lalone always talks about that. Think about the kind of game Tyler Bertuzzi plays. One of the goals that went in uh, against Buffalo, yeah, there's maybe Ned should have stopped the puck, but that whole play started because Tyler Bertuzzi decided to dive and try to pick up a puck. And it's like, why are you even diving? Because where are you going to get if you knock that puck? Like you're on the ice. He's not the world's most agile skater. Put himself out of position that Buffalo gets a break, et cetera, et cetera. That's a that was a microcosm of the kind of risk he brings to his game. So all those things, and yeah, he's he's not been good this year. It's limited window, but he's not been the Tyler Bertuzzi that we know. So now when people ask us, hey, what should you do? Sign him or trade him? I think we just throw our, our arms up in the air in exasperation because I I don't have a good answer here. I would love I would love at this point, unless something drastic changes, I would love a contract with Bertuzzi, a short-term contract, which he won't sign. Absolutely not. Nor should he. It's his big earnest, biggest earning opportunity of his life. He's going to try to capitalize on it. Same thing as Dylan Larkin. If you're pending UFA, that's, that's what you do. But at the same time, If the most likely outcome, based on all the things that we talked about and based on the fact that Tyler Bertuzzi has had contentious negotiations with his team every single contract, that he was going to be traded because you don't want to let him go to, to free agency for nothing. It's almost an impossible task right now unless you take a big hit on the value. We're getting way too far ahead of ourselves. It's December 1st. He comes back. He lights it up. It, it only takes so much time. Nick Letty earned Detroit a phenomenal return for him in like 48 hours worth of play. Like <laughs> It doesn't take a lot of time to convince a, a GM, especially a GM who's in the right position to trade the right assets for the right player. You know, think about LA or think about whoever you might want to think about, but... Right now, a lot has to turn around for Detroit to get anywhere close to maximum value on Bertuzzi on either the trade front or the extension front. And both have their massive barriers in front of them for for big reasons. The biggest risk here is that he walks to free agency for nothing, and that would be catastrophic as dramatic, but really, really bad. I think I think the organization would read the room and read the situation prior to the trade deadline and would trade him for anything at that point. Yeah, yeah. And like that's I just suppose, like, you know, not trading him gives you a little bit more room to continue negotiations, but you've had so long to yeah. continue to do that and like the relationship ebbs and flows like I just can't imagine them going past the trade deadline and then letting him walk. Like that just from an asset management perspective that does not seem like the right play to do. All right. Well, I'm gl- I wasn't going to bring it up, but you kind of alluded to it there. So it's probably a question worth asking. Say the Red Wings are hanging around the playoff race and like actually hanging around, not like six points out of the trade deadline because we know the actual odds on that. Where's your cutoff for a return number two Z where you're like, no, you know what? Screw it. Let's just keep him in case we get in. Like, is it a first round pick, a second round pick, a third round pick? I, I don't go lower than a second, but even that would hurt, right? He's not getting a first right now. Not not right now. No, he's he's not. Um not unless you can convince a GM that hey. Hey, he's a good old Ontario boy. GMs oh. are meatheads. All right, I'll I'll throw Crazier that. stuff. <laughs> ben Sherratt got a king's ransom. Yeah. Crazier things have happened. You know what might actually be a good comparison for very different reasons? Does Tyler Bertuzzi's return in a tr- potential trade is it greater or less than what Ken Holland got for Athanasiu? Two seconds. Right now? I Right now, I don't think he gets Right that. now, I think it's less. Yeah, I agree. But you, we're talking about this. The guy just went on IR. So right now is a stupid, maybe a stupid frame of reference. But, you know, uh, uh, that's close. I He's not going to have a huge window to pump up his trade value. So he was at what? 
five, six weeks on the first broken hand. So hypothetically, if it's about the same timeline, he'll have about six-ish weeks. Let's say he's back January 1. Just just to eight, make it fast. Eight-ish weeks to pump up his trade values. So very doable. That's a healthy amount of games. But if it takes him any time to get back to his usual self, if he has that slow start back like he did after the last one, it it might not be good because let's not forget when Athens you got traded the season prior, he had 30 plus goals. Now, obviously Bertuzzi's got a way better reputation around the league because of the intangibles he comes with. And the he's got more dimension to his game than Athens you did. But in terms of production, there wasn't a dramatic difference. I understand Bertuzzi's higher, but can I say something naive and stupid? Maybe the silver, that's what we're here for. Maybe the, the silver lining is Bertuzzi does this, uh, like he realizes that this season isn't going his way and signs a contract that's more favorable to Detroit in either term or money. Like I said, naive and stupid. There's absolutely Who knows? I yeah. have no idea anymore. People always ask, uh, they, they say, what do you want personally? I'm like, when there, you have to separate what we talk about in terms of being likely or, or possibilities and what we want personally. What I would want personally is for Tyler Bertuzzi to stay on this team. Take five million for eight years. That would be ideal. Do they give Tyler Bertuzzi eight years right now? No, I don't know. No chance. Yeah, but five mil in eight year in six years is like chump change. Yeah, it's like half of it, like half of Evan's salary. That would That's you right. take that discount? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you didn't show but up I'm, two episodes. I'm I'm ruthless. I never side with the, what the company wants. Yeah, the checks didn't clear. HR Evan, the HR destroyer, lob singer. That's right. That's what they call him. Anyhow. I do hesitate to get too far down the rabbit hole while IR is just starting for him. So we'll see what the prognosis is, how far uh, along he'll be before he returns to the game uh, with the the break in his hand or wrist. But it is bad news for Bertuzzi. It's bad news for Steve Eiserman. It's bad news for Red Wings fans. It's bad news for those who want Bertuzzi signed at all costs. And it's bad news for those who want Bertuzzi traded before he walks for nothing. It is just a bad start all around. And with that, let's go to an ad break. This episode <laughs> of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by NordVPN. Are you missing out on a game or your favorite show because it's not available in your region? Good news. Let me introduce NordVPN. Using NordVPN in a click of a button, you can watch and browse as if you're elsewhere in the world, making sure you never miss a game and can watch whatever content you'd like. No need to travel across a continent or oceans for your favorite team when NordVPN brings them right to you. With over 5,000 server options, no game or show is out of your reach. Using our special promo code NordVPN.com slash winged wheel, you can receive a huge discount on NordVPN cybersecurity two-year plan plus four free months. We all love to binge, but privacy is a big deal too. NordVPN keeps your information encrypted so you never have to worry about your IP or location getting out. They've also doubled down on keeping you safe with their new threat protection feature. Say goodbye to intrusive website ads and malware. Even if you download an infected file, threat protection kicks in and deletes it before it makes a mess of your computer. Don't forget, there's no risk to you with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Give it a try, and if you like it, great. If you don't, they'll issue a refund, and you can pretend the entire thing never happened. Check out our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, to get your subscription started today. All right, Brad, pre-show, you said there had, there had to be a referendum on a player, and uh, you felt that it was overdue for the fan base to kind of talk about this player. Um, it's an uncomfortable topic, and, and I don't want to be the, the bearer of bad news, so... This one's on you. Listen, we all understood he was coming to a new team. He was coming off an injury, surgery, didn't have a training camp. But the referendum is now for Andrew Kopp because we have a really good sample size of Andrew Kopp and what he is as a player. He is so good. He's good, man. He is really good. That pass to Sunquist on Sunquist first goal. How wow. many players in the league make that pass? That was filthy. Behind, Rasmus, behind Rasmus the tried net. it a couple of times, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah, and I'm pretty sure he bounced it off the back of the net every time. <laughs> oh, well. Cop misses the back of the net, puts it on his tape with Craig Anderson peeking out the other side of the net. I mean, he, you know, faceoffs aren't as impactful as everybody makes them out to be, but he wins the faceoff right to Oscar Sunquist for the tying goal as well. He's defensively responsible, and the points are starting to come now. He is not flashy. He's never going to be flashy, and I think people are starting to realize that. But flashy and effective are two very different things, and this this guy is effective. 
with it's like a, f- a switch flipped when we started talking about cops injury max boltman came on the show and said you know Derek Lalone and some other people have talked about the kind of surgery that he had and how long it took players to come back from that you know i think everything in, in detroit red wings fandom gets talked about with uh <laughs> with respect to steven stamkos but he had some kind of similar surgery and they said he wasn't himself for nine months and you here we are after, what, 10, 15 games looking at Andrew Cobb saying, ah, what's the deal with this guy? And a, a switch flipped, and all of a sudden his game started eking forward. And like you said, Brad, he's not a world beater offensively. He never will be, even at his best, but he's impactful. And that's, you can see the kind of player that he is. I think arguably, I know Sunk has put, put in two goals, but arguably he was up there with the Red Wings' best players against uh, Buffalo. And he got moved to a line that with le- argue, like ostensibly less talent on it. Well, when he was with, um, it was him, Raymond, and Bertuzzi. Bertuzzi. Yeah, they were good. They were good. That was a good line. Um, and we talked about Bertuzzi. So Bertuzzi was not the one driving that line. Obviously, Lucas Raymond was the driver of the bus a lot of that time. But when he wasn't, it was caught. And now that cop uh, was put on the third line to hopefully get Sunkfist and um, was it Ernie going again? Well, against uh, the Leafs, Ernie scored, and against uh, Buffalo, Sunkfist had two. Andrew Cop, again, you don't want to marry a player to a, a, a predetermined path with the team this early on, but it bodes well. I think when we were talking about him before saying it's a slow start and yes, he's been disappointing, but he's been injured. This is what we need to see next for there to be optimism in terms of what he could bring to the Red Wings, considering his contract, the length and the number he has done that X, Y, Z. He has done enough to give the Red Wings that optimism and holy hell, is that important now with, you know, Elmer Soderblom's not close to coming back. Tyler Bertuzzi is now back on IR. No offense to Austin Zarnick, but he's not slotting in that top six. Or if he is, it's not because he's a top six player. It's just because Derek Lalonde's trying something. It's important that Andrew Kopp is one of Detroit's most impactful players, and that's what he's been doing. And with you know Kublik, Larkin, and Raymond, or whoever it might be on that first line, getting the toughest matchups and sometimes getting caved, which we've been seeing a little bit lately, uh, that is even more important for the Red Wings. They're not a deep offensive team. They're not all of a sudden, like Cop is still their 2C, and you'd hope he's their 3C because they have someone in in and around Larkin's talent level, which I don't know what, where you get that from at this point, like a trade, uh, you hope Casper comes in next year and is immediately impactful, whatever. But Cop is one hell of a stopgap, and if he's able to elevate the players around him this early on, that's a huge, huge, huge win for the Red Wings and Steve Eisenman. He is more than capable to be the guy until the guy gets here. Yeah. Who the hell ever that might be. And that's that's by design. Like, that's what he was brought in for. Okay. Imagine a team where Andrew Kopp's your 3C. What do you think? Like Larkin, Casper uh, Kopp? Eventually, I don't think Casper is getting in. I think Cops the two C ahead of Casper for at least a couple more seasons. Unless Casper comes in and kicks down the door. Unless you're supremely confident in Marco Casper turning into like a, a Dylan Larkin light, the answer probably comes from outside the organization at this point because I don't think the Red Wings are going to be picking high enough to find it in the draft at this point because you know it's not like Jason Robertson's ever sitting there at one of your picks. But uh, I don't want to talk about it. But yeah. Well, hey, Jason Robertson, uh, second and uh, first in goal scoring? Yep, yep, first in goal scoring. I mean, the guy right behind him, one of the guys right behind him is a UFA this summer. Jason Robertson's on the left side, right? Not the right side? He's a lefty, yeah. Yeah, so he plays left wing. That'd be great. I mean, the guy, one of the guys right behind him is a center and a pending UFA, Ryan. Oh, Bo Horvat. Bobo. Without a contract, and it's not looking likely in Vancouver. <laughs> yeah, does anything look like Vancouver's got their <laughs> shit together in any capacity? No. You know, listen, I I know Bo Horvat's going to command the earth, moon, and stars. Because he's playing like he's in a contract. He's doing what Dylan Larkin's doing. He's shooting 23%. He's literally trying to break the puck every time he shoots it to to get a contract. Hey, but if he keeps it up, a a center, needy team will probably pay the earth, moon, and stars for him. So I wouldn't rule Detroit out on that one. Can you imagine Detroit going from paying Larkin six point whatever he is right now to 
him and Horvat, the mega bucks combined for like 20 mil. Yeah. Honestly, though, where else is that answer coming from? Again, unless you are supremely confident in Marco Casper. Which, hey, he's been great. Yes. With Roglic. Oh, I'm I'm super confident Marco Casper, but not as a Dylan Larkin. And not next year. No. Okay. Let's move on. I think that's uh that's getting into a rabbit hole that we probably should give attention to in a future episode. But for now, there's there's things that actually happened for Detroit. Uh remember when they claimed Magnus Helberg on waivers? It's his second stint with Detroit. Feels like that was three weeks ago. Honestly. And he just sat in the press box, sat scratched. Brad, you you had a great uh, explanation last episode as to how, or two episodes ago, as to how they could do it. Uh, they had the roster room. They could leave him in the press box. Uh, saw him at the game. Huge, dude. You forget how big goalies are. Just oh, yeah. monstrous. Um, Sean Shapiro on Twitter, and we just had him on the show recently. Uh, great guy and and follow Shap Shots. Um, but he made a good point that the Red Wings could send Helberg down on a conditioning stint. He spends enough time, the league, the Red Wings can get approval from the league to send him down on a conditioning stint to the AHL, to the Grand Rapids Griffins. And the notable part about that is he gets to spend some time in the AHL, he gets some games in, gets accustomed to, to playing again, gets his feet under him, and he doesn't have to go through waivers. So if he had to go through waivers... He'd like, be back in Seattle or Ottawa. Likely be claimed, right? Seattle wanted to... Probably want to keep him. Anyways, he'd want to be claimed. He would He would be way more likely to be claimed than Cal Peterson. Yes. Has uh, it, have his pads arrived, by the way? I'm not sure. He needs I, to keep all of those on him at all times, apparently. Yeah, they were they were back in Sweden, but uh, I hope we see them, uh, at least with his little conditioning student in Grand Rapids. So he's sent down, and he can be called back up uh, to play for the Red Wings immediately. He would just have to stick on the roster if he did so. So the Red Wings and Steve Eisman have bought themselves some flexibility in goaltending. Um, I don't think they're too hot on Oklahoma down in Grand Rapids. It's not like Bratstrom has been playing great either. Um, but, yep, so Helberg dodges waivers, uh, does his conditioning stint. That's, you know, news in and of itself, but I think that also points to one other thing here. That's a pretty major point of focus for the Red Wings. Alex Nedeljkovic, going back to the start of last season, has not been. Like, I, I would say November to de- early December-ish, of, so 12 months ago of last season, has not been dialed in and, you know, as hot as he was to start. Not the Carolina Alex Nedeljkovic. He's been bad this year. I love Ned. I I think he's an extremely talented goalie. I would love a Huso ned tandem. That absolutely rocks it for Detroit. You have some very smart goalie people who say that guy has all the tools to succeed. Kevin Woodley knows his stuff and said that is a you know at the very least an above average in terms of talent goaltending tandem. But he's not been good this year. He's been off his game. Uh, some games I, I don't think is as much his fault as uh, people say it is. And some games I'm like, I don't think there are words to describe how much those pucks should not have gone in. And I think of LA and I think of the Buffalo game. Are we seeing a risk where Alex Nedeljkovic might be waived if Alex or if Magnus Helberg plays well and, and is doing well in his conditioning stint, or you know they move him for cheap or whatever it might be? Like, does he is is the crunch time now? Does he have to pick it up right now to stick on this team? Without being alarmist, I'm going to say yes. Not because I think the Red Wings have hit any alarm bells, but claiming Helberg kind of was hitting an alarm bell. Again, when it happened, understanding there was a very, very small chance they would ever be able to get him through Grand Rap to Grand Rapids with out it being just a conditioning stint. Cause again, he would have to clear waivers to stay down there. And again, Seattle and Ottawa would be right there. The curious part was what was the long-term play here because we all knew about the flexibility in the short term. They didn't bring Helberg in because of Huso. They didn't bring Helberg in with any certainty that he was going to be Grand Rapids' help. So that really does just point to one thing, and when you do have a struggling goalie in the last year of his contract, at at... Most, it's plausible. 
and I think that's where it's sitting for me is I this is no longer in the territory of this would be a massive surprise. I don't know that I'm going out there and saying it's absolutely going to happen, but there are only so many more times where Ned can come out there and have that performance, especially when the focus for the Red Wings team this season isn't to get Connor Bedard, Connor Bedard or, or Fantilli or Mishkov. It's to to win as many games as they can. Like This is a team that, that wants to improve. And what did Steve Eisenman say the Iser plan is on his TNT interview? Get good players, something like that. That's the Iser plan. Bold. Yeah. Simple as, but... Hmm. Ned's putting up uh, 880 save percentage for $3 million bucks in his contract year. They have the cap space to eat some of his cap hit if he gets waived or if he gets claimed, whatever. And honestly, if he gets waived, does he even get claimed? Yeah. The Leafs signed yeah. Keith Petrozelli for God's sake. Yeah, Someone would... will take a, a roll the dice on uh, uh, Nadelkovic. I don't think he hits waivers. Because there are enough goalie needy teams out there who would be desperate enough to trade for him, call it a sixth or seventh round pick, yeah. still better than losing him on waivers. Um, maybe there's a team that really likes Nedeljkovic and with a bit of salary retained, all of a sudden maybe you're actually getting a d- half decent return for him. I- I'd be hard pressed to think there's not a team out there that would not be intrigued by one uh, one point five ish million dollar Alex Nedeljkovic. So what do you think? They just scratch him, put him in the press box for a while? For all the reasons we laid out with Helberg last week, it could just as easily apply to Nadalkovich. Now with Bertuzzi going down as well. Yeah, that buys space. That buys space. The Red Wings are well, not going to run into an issue where they can't carry three goalies because of healthy scratches. Because if you wave Robert Hag right now, is he getting claimed? No. No. So they, they have lots of flexibility in terms of carrying three goalies for as long as they need to. And I and we said this all before the Bertuzzi injury. When we assumed Soderblom might be imminent to return, which doesn't look like the case anymore. All these <laughs> injuries suck and it's crazy to actually look at when you start piling them up. But the benefit is they have all the time in the world to be patient with all three goalies if they so choose. LA almost had an easier time, so they wave Cal Peterson. Cal Peterson has this season and two more at $5 million with a modified no-trade clause. Oops. Oof. <laughs> yeah. That, you that, can already see Arizona licking their lips right now. Well, he cleared waivers in LA. <laughs> LA was there. They probably had two thoughts. One, this might be a terrible contract and whatever. Someone might take it at which point they're doing us a favor. Or two, look, we're not giving up on Cal Peterson, but he needs A, a message, and B, some time with uh, down in, in the Ontario? AHL with Are the Ontario are? Reign. Yeah. So no, like they can do that comfortably. With Ned, it's a different story. You're right. He might fall into the territory where people watch his game. And, and this is where I fall. They say, oh, it's still a talented goalie. His head's just not on straight right, right now. Goalies are, are mental in every single way. They are absolute nutcases, and they when they're in a groove, they're so dialed in, and anyone turns into a Vesna goalie, and when they're off, you're like, oh, my God, you look like Evan out there recording a podcast at 9.57 p.m. Yeah. You should have been at the breakfast this morning. That was the witching hour for you. Jesus. That was... I the told- only time I've been up that early is for golf, and <laughs> other than that, there's no reason for me to exist at that time i told the room i said bunch of you guys sold out a room to watch a bunch of hockey players struggle to to be their best selves in the morning that's how i know you're dedicated to this good cause good for you chris draper's just wearing a foam dome filled with coffee oh hey chris chris was the uh the most awake alert alive of all of us he strikes me as like the 5 30 gym guy ozzy sat down i was there just putting my notes together and ozzy sat down and i looked at him i was like Morning person too, eh? He's like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, with the Red Wings with, with Nedeljkovic, it's uncomfortable, right? It, it's you almost don't want to acknowledge it because you're like, how do you go from you trade for this guy, you get him what seems like on the cheap when he's performing as he is with, uh, to start with Detroit? You're like, oh, this is like same thing as as what we thought with Huso right now. Like Detroit got a steal. They got a guy who could potentially be a starter for a few years or at least a 1A, 1B situation to, 
hey, is waivers is waivers in the cards for him if he doesn't pick it up? I personally hope they don't. I I don't wouldn't necessarily agree with the decision. I think they should stick it out because I've seen the talent there. But you can only ask Steve Eisman to stick it out for so long if the Red Wings are losing points off the board because Ned isn't stopping pucks. You can only throw a guy out there so many times before you got to you got to pull the shoot in some capacity. Yeah. Like, it's a it's not good for him because nobody wants to be out there and getting absolutely shelled and b it's not good for the team like no. you got to do something the and the the start that he got right two home games first one against the leafs that's a tougher matchup you give that one to huso even though huso was probably tired by that point Day off, another home game against Buffalo, who has not been a good team this year. Yeah, Tage Thompson's unreal. Uh, they have some players who can do some damage there, but all in all, Buffalo's a way weaker challenge than Toronto. That's the start Ned wants. That We can do all the complaining we want of, you know, Ned hasn't had the best setups. That was a great setup for Ned. It wasn't a back-to-back, and it was a home start against a weak team. Completely random tangent that you brought up, Tage Thompson. Did you see his goal against Tampa? Oh, my God. Oh my! It's like he signed that contract. He heard everyone's criticism, ours included. Not of him as a player, just about the risk. The around. risk in the contract, because he was unreal. You know, in the season before the contract, it's just, do you guarantee that kind of money for a guy who only did that once? Yeah. And he went out there and said, "No, I'm not going to do that again. I'm actually going to be even better." Yeah. He's like, "Oh, oh, you think I'm worth that money? <laughs> I'll show you." Tage Thompson is like Michael Rasmussen's frame with Patrick Kane's hands. Yeah. It's it's almost like it sounds like hyperbole, but it's like that's it's what it is. It, he's like, he had a spinorama backhand toe drag around the goalie from behind the goal line, bring it out and tuck it. Like I don't use this word a lot, but that goal was erotic. Yeah, it was. That is disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> Evan is out the door. <laughs> Evan's like, I wish I took more than two episodes away. Did from you me. see the goal? It was disturbing. That's Alex Nedeljkovic. Yeah, I hope. I really hope this is one of those conversations we have that looks absolutely stupid soon. He gets another start. He comes out. He's the on Tage fire. The Thompson effect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Honestly. Uh, and I, I wouldn't be surprised, but it would things would have to turn around for him. Granted, he was solid after <laughs> such a stupid thing to say about a hockey game, but he was solid after the four goals he let in, most of which were softies. But he was. He made some key saves, and, he, and that game could, could have been even worse. If he buckled down. But... He has no choice but to buckle down from here on out if he wants to stay. Some NHL news. Uh, scary moment. Chris Letang was announced that he had his it was second stroke. Um, and so he's away, obviously, from hockey indefinitely. And you know he has a history of uh, this kind of medical condition. And you hoped that it would not arise from again. And the most surprising thing, like he's, he's doing well. And the most surprising thing is that it's not expected to be career-threatening. He's expected back this year. They said it was less severe than the stroke he had in 2014. That's remarkable. Great news as far as bad news goes. Yeah, you you hope to see him back if and when he's ready. I honestly, I read the news and I thought, oh man, is that it for one of the greatest defensemen of the generation? And no, the answer is no. Chris Letang is going. To, the warrior that he is is going to make himself or uh, make his way back. Absolutely unbelievable. Uh, Steven Stamkos, I think just tonight, hit 1,000 points. But uh, why don't we talk about not the NHL scoring leader. That's Connor McDavid. But why don't we talk about a certain left winger, not Alex Ovechkin, a guy who was drafted one pick after Gustav Lindstrom. In the- you had to. You had to. I had to do it. Hey, You absolute prick. Twitter brought it up to us. I have to bring it I'm, to the rest I'm, of the world. I'm going to come up with a quote. I'm going to use a quote to describe what you just did. You'll know who I'm quoting right away. Oh, shoot. Sure. <laughs> I know what this is. It would have cost you $0 <laughs> to not say that. <laughs> well, I heard whoever said that is such an asshole. Absolutely. No hair on his head. Uh, Jason Robertson, through 23 games, has 19 goals, 17 assists for 36 points. I understand Dallas didn't get the term on the contract, but they already have that guy at a steal. He didn't even go to training camp. He just showed up and did that. Here we are, like, ah, Bertuzzi, cop, didn't play. 
Jason Robertson is an absolute freak. He is making 7.75 for the next four years, and I think that's going to be a steal for Dallas for all four of those years. Dallas's cup window is now three years because he is taking every bit of salary cap space they have on his next contract. Second only to Connor McDavid uh, in points through 23 games. McDavid has 41. Obviously, he's doing Connor McDavid things, leading the league in goals with 19. I talked to people who played with uh, Jason Robertson or or coached actually, and all they've said the entire way through his career has been, no, this guy's the truth. And that was underselling him. He might be the poster child for why you don't overthink production in juniors. Like, oh yeah, his skating's a little wonky or X, Y, and Z. Yeah, but he's scoring 217 points. Like, (laughs) it helps. It certainly helps. Uh, and then Ovi broke the record for away goals, career away goals in NHL history, or tied the record, I should say. No, I think he, I think he tied it and then broke it later it. in the same game. Got I it. think yeah. against Vancouver, I believe. Of course, it would be against Boudreaux. Oh, how fitting is that? I bet Boudreaux liked that a little bit. Knowing Bruce Boudreaux in that moment, he absolutely did not. Yeah, you're right. He he scored twice, passing Wayne Gretzky for the most road goals in NHL history. Uh, 403 of his 793 career goals away from home. The fact that that split is in favor of road goals just That's goes insane. What a freak. What when I saw that stat two things jumped to mind immediately. One, I know it's an obscure stat, but whenever you're breaking a record held by Wayne Gretzky, like holy shit. And two, what was going on with Wayne Gretzky's splits cuz he's still like 100 goals ahead of Ovechkin. It is <laughs> that man I, I, you, just based on how much technology and training and understanding of the game has brought everyone closer together, I don't think we'll ever see a player dominate his peers like Wayne Gretzky dominated his. It's such a fun dichotomy between the two because they could not be any more different. You've got Alex Ovechkin, this guy who I'm, who is built like a brick shit house. I'm pretty sure he actually plays the troll in that new troll movie. <laughs> What new troll movie? You haven't seen know. that? It's, it was literally know. all over my Netflix feed. Anyways, just, yeah, this giant troll that just comes in and kicks down buildings. It looks like a veg. Yeah, we call him Evan. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And then you have this skinny little nerd from the 80s who just somehow put up a billion points. And now that's the competition is the r- big rush machines chasing the, the skinny kid from Bram- Brantford. It's, it's, it's so fun. Like, this is the beauty of hockey. Could not be more different, accomplish the same thing. Man, you would love golf. Yeah, I know. I know. Fat people, skinny ki- skinny people, kids who play with rocks. Is that the saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it is. <laughs> <laughs> they all can, some of them can all hit the golf ball just as well as one another. <laughs> uh, talking to Daniel Halloran, he's from Essex, Ontario. Yep just outside of Windsor. And, and if you played for either Riverside or Windsor growing up, you Windsor and Riverside, you know, intra-city uh, games, those are always tough games and you go hard and people leave bleeding, whatever. If either one of those teams went into the Essex bar and you went in with friends because there would be brawls no matter what and you would need to make sure you made it out. And we used to say about people from Essex, we, we used to say, yeah, th- those kids aren't readers for sure. <laughs> 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 they uh, They're pretty good though. It's because they beat us a lot. Okay. Uh, any other NHL news before we jump into overtime? Actually, you know what? We did uh, we did hot stove stories for breakfast. I'm going to call the audible and just jump right into overtime on this one. This is uh, officially the midweek episode of the Winged Wheel podcast, so it is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. If you want to support the Winged Wheel podcast, patreon.com slash podcast. You get benefits like uh, access to our uh, Patreon exclusive overtime episode that we record right after these. You get access to the uh, Winged Wheel Podcast official Discord, which is a great time. We are giving away two tickets to every single Detroit Red Wings home game this season, and the majority of those are going to patrons. You're automatically entered into contests. Uh, Evan will send you little kissy emojis every night if you sign up for that. Uh, whatever it might be, uh, we have a ton of great benefits, and it, it really helps the show. It helps us keep the show going, grow the show, and do things like support the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Why don't we take uh, some comments here? Um, Simon says, 27, says, how is it fair that challenging a goal um, ends up as a penalty if the call on the ice stands? Challenging the goal is trying to keep the game fair. 
Would it be worth it to change the rule to have a team lose their timeout like football instead of being penalized? Football has three timeouts, so that makes it complicated. There's a reason for this, and it this rule was brought about because people like me would not shut up, and this was the NHL's supposed solution to it. We've all sat here at different points and complained about is an offside review really worth it if you have to bust out a microscope to see if his skate was or wasn't on the line or if his skate did or did not tap the end of the goalie stick, whatever? The penalty was put in place to scare the coaches from challenging the plays that objectively didn't impact the play. Hey, can you look at that replay? Are you sure he was offside? You are positive? Okay, challenge, because we will overturn it. But if you're like... I I think he might be offside. I don't care about a timeout. I'm just going to 50-50 it and roll the dice. They wanted to stop that because if it was that close, it should not be reviewed. And I, I agree with that premise. I mean, I don't think this was the solution, but their heart was in the right place. That's the whole, whole reason this is in place is to scare coaches from challenging the 50-50 calls. I didn't think I would agree with it. But seeing how contentious 50-50 calls are now, I like it. I like that there's a little bit of punishment. The same way where I didn't agree with uh, initially when they brought in the if you win the face-off illegally with your hand or dropped your knee or whatever, the minor penalty there, or you get tossed twice. Like I, I didn't love that. I'm like, it seems a little chintzy to me. But I'm like, it just it keeps the game going. And it's the spirit of a lot of what, when Brad screams and yells and it's not at Evan or I, it's usually at the offside reviews or things like that. And and what Brad is doing is it's keeping the flow and the spirit of the game going, and, and that's what those penalties do in my mind. So that's one thing where I actually have come around very quickly to to appreciate. Uh, Ginger Beard Man says, if the Wings are in a playoff spot, actually, one other thing. Um, Dan and Wes brought to Hot Stove Stories, they brought two clips. It was really cool. The first one is to quiz the crowd, kind of flipped it around on them. The first one was, do you remember when Bobby Ryan got a stick taken by Miko Koivu? Yes. And he picked up Miko Koivu's stick after and scored with it, and it was a, a lefty-righty swap even? Yeah. Yep. He brought that up. He showed it. He was like, by the rule book, good goal, yes or no? No. Yeah, no. You can't score with an opponent's stick. Yeah. It counted at the time, but Dan said, and he's like, I personally think it should count, but by the rule book, that should not have counted. So I think justice was served that day, but as it should have gone, it shouldn't have counted. And then they were talking about offside reviews, and they showed that uh, that McAvoy very smart non touch up to let his teammate tag up, where he pushed the puck over the line, didn't touch the puck, his teammate tagged. The Kale McCarr Valerie and Chushkin play yes. in the playoffs last year, but McAvoy's was McAvoy's was so fast that in in real time that is like one of the hottest calls a linesman has ever made. First sentence, first time that sentence has ever been used. Um, compared to, but compared to the. McCarr won. That may as well have been as as clear as the Duchesne offside that one day. But they showed that clip. The majority of the crowd and the people who are in that crowd, you know, hockey fans. If you're if you're waking up that early in the morning to see a bunch of hockey meatheads talk, you're hockey fans. The vast majority of that crowd raised their hands and said that was an offside play. And I remember on the McCarr Nachushkin play when those first replays hit Twitter, ninety percent of the people were like, that's a thousand percent offside. Are you kidding me? Look, his feet are over the line, completely missing the context. It wasn't an entering the zone. It was a tag up. Yeah. It is so insanely hard to get things right when they get, when it's slowed down and at game speed, the fact that the lines get it as right, as correct, uh, as often as they do, I think that's really underappreciated. I appreciate it. That's why I'm trying to have them have more control and get rid of the reviews. <laughs> Uh, Ginger Beard Man says if the Wings are in a playoff spot come the trade deadline, would Eisenman call Chicago about Taves to fill the 2C spot and would Taves waive his no-move clause to even play in Detroit? I'd imagine we'd need to be almost sure bets to make the playoffs for both parties to consider it. You're right about that second part for sure. Yeah. I think if the Red Wings are looking to add at the deadline, which I don't see a scenario where I would agree with that, the better candidate I'd circle back here would be Horvat. He's just a better player. If you're going to buy, buy a better player. The, the, there would be a significant difference in cost, but I think T Taves would be overpriced enough where you're like, shit, in for a penny, in for a pound, for spending, I know that, let's spend. I know this isn't what they would go for, but 
like just for kicks and giggles, assuming it's not 2023, what would you rather give up a second for Taze or a first for Horvat? First. A thousand percent. I'd, if it came with a contract. Oh, if it came with a contract, I'd give up more than that. No, no, like not a sign and trade, but like understanding that there was a contract in place when he got there. But I guess then Vancouver would charge more and blah, blah, blah. Which I would happily pay. They'd probably be asking, like, Veronica Bertuzzi might be going the other way there or whatever prospect, not like top level prospect. But yeah, don't touch 2023, but 2024, maybe. I don't know. Like if you're giving up like a mid round pick and Chicago retains half, oh yeah, absolutely. No, but um, Colorado will pay more. Exactly. And Detroit won't be that team. It's an interesting The only thought. thing with Taze, though, th- this is the one thing I will say that gives Detroit an advantage. Detroit might be one of the very, very few teams that could afford Taves cap space wise. Yeah. Because a lot of teams would not be able to afford him unless there was a double retention. Well, maybe they move him uh they move him as an intermediary. The storyline we pick up every year for the past however many years since yep. they allowed that to start ha- start happening. Uh Tate Bowen and Keenan O'Donohue both have questions about Bertuzzi. They say, Does Bertuzzi does the Bertuzzi injury complicate any possible contract talks? What do you think both sides' approach should be if they're interested in getting a deal done? And then Keenan says, is there any way we add a forward now that Bertuzzi is out again? Uh, I'll circle back with the to the second part of that question with the, I don't think the Red Wings should be adding this year. You only add if you're a cup contender in my mind. Unless it's a long-term solution. Again, circle back, Horvat, sign and trade, something like that. You trade for a young guy who's got some term left. I don't know. Um, I don't have any names off the top of my head. Um, and circling back to the Bertuzzi thing, I think it's in the best interest of both parties right now to wait. Yeah, You can you can ride this all the way down to the deadline, no problem. And if you get another six to eight weeks of Bertuzzi playing by then, it should hopefully provide a bit more valuable context and information. Yeah, you're hoping that the worst of the Bertuzzi situation is right now, that we've seen it, and that he's able to come back from this. And again, we uh, we Tage Thompson that conversation. It looks stupid in retrospect because he's comes back as unreal and either signs an amazing contract with Detroit or Detroit finds a way to make the most value out of, um, out of that asset. Matt McKay says, hey, fellas, after watching the Wings game against the Leafs, one thing I noticed was our lack of a true superstar like a Marner or Matthews. Is there any way that... Uh, is there anyone that would be of that caliber that the Wings could sign or trade for, or is that only found through the draft? Thanks for all you do, Matt. How patient are you? In about a year and a half, I think there's an Austin Matthews available. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Look, Detroit would be further down that list of teams who could afford of the teams who could afford him. Detroit would still be near the bottom of the teams who could possibly acquire him. You know, Toronto at the top, Arizona up there as well, but. When someone of Austin Matthews' caliber comes up as a UFA, you're not ignoring him as a GM. Just so people know, don't get your hopes up, but know that Eisenman's making the call. Again, the one advantage the Red Wings might have over other teams, again, I don't think they're the favorite. I agree with you fully. But not a lot of teams are going to have 15 mil in cap space. Detroit might. Arizona will have 20, yeah, whatever, that, whatever the it. max percentage is. It's hard. It's not impossible to get those players elsewhere. You know, you take advantage of teams who are being impatient with with uh, young players. You take advantage of situations, like weird situations like Vegas did with Jack Eichel. It's not impossible, but it's extremely difficult because teams know what they have. Look at what Buffalo did with Tage Thompson. They look like they're proving everyone to be idiots because they're like, no, we know we see this guy better was, than everyone. That was the Ryan O'Reilly trade, wasn't it? Was it actually? I think it was. Mm. It's amazing how, like, remember how fleeced Buffalo was on that trade, except now they weren't. Remember how fleeced Ottawa or Ottawa was on the Eric Carlson trade, except now they weren't. Yeah. Although that one kind of has come back around again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> T- Berglund, Sabotka, Thompson. Yep. Time, time does funny things to perspective. It really does. It is. It's so reactionary in like in the business that we're in. By nature, a, a an insane proportion of our takes, so to speak. Neutral, though, they maybe are going to end up being cold because you just don't have that length, time length perspective. So you have to be patient with those kinds of things. Mind you, some there's also a lot of things that are bad from the start to end. <laughs> it does happen. 
a lot of UFA contracts with the Red Wings' previous general manager, for example. But eh, can't think me. of any. Don't know what you're talking about. Okay, folks. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, thank you all for your support of Hot Stove Stories with Mickey and Ken. Uh, for those of you who came, who bid uh, in the auctions, you raised fantastic support for the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Go to jamiedanielsfoundation.org. Visit uh, wingedwheelpodcast.com slash wings MOTB for wings money on the board information. Go to detroitredwings.com slash WWP uh, to get your tickets to Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA in partnership with the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, all of our listeners, new and old, we appreciate you tuning in. The sponsors of this episode, NordVPN, thank you. NordVPN.com slash winged wheel. Uh, and we'd like to thank all of our name level sponsors on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sierra Grand Foundation, Akefer, Armchair GM slash Genius, Nick Perks, Terry Driver of the number 69, Crying Ryan, Hannes Banana, Slam and Jamathong, Glenn Brabham, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Brandon M., Carl Brutin and Nanaluski, Chimmy, Chris Ball, Chris P., Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Evan Lob Singing, Mash Bringing, Hash Slinging Slasher. Been waiting for you to hear that one. You don't like that one? My God. <laughs> <laughs> Give Blood Fight Probert, Red Hot, Ronick, Hassam Al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joseph Berry, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Ensaladas Picantes, Marcus, Matt McKay, Nedelkovich, Goalie Number One, Nicholas Fritz, RA, Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Send It Sea Wolf, The Podcasting Couch, Venom, Worst Ryan, Zachary Rogers, Venom. Thank you so much for becoming a name level sponsor. Um, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Zachary Rogers, in case I missed it. Sam Bankson, number one Detroit Red Guys fan. Adam, I wish I could finish like Ernie. Uh, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landiscog, Ben Barron, Brad Simmons, uh, Brian Vasha, Connor Leighton, Darren Fick, Philip Zadiz Nuts, Peronix Handlebar, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Linda Hull, Logan Burgos, Matt Keeler, Matt S., Loyal Soldier of the Cheesebag Army, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Reed Baldwin on behalf of the Reed Baldwin Foundation, Thick Rick, and Aaron Hudson. Thank you all so much. I am going to sleep. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.